Well, grace to you. Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I bless you tonight with wholeness and benefit, with prosperity and with favor, with the blessings of the Lord that make one rich and add no sorrow to it. May the Lord blessings come upon you and overtake you as you hearken diligently unto his voice. I want to welcome you tonight to the Global Pentecostal Perspectives live stream. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm so uh, uh, happy to see each and every one of you on the stream on tonight. Do me a favor. Good evening, good evening, good evening. And weigh in. Let me know where you're coming in from. I see you all the way from Chicago and from Long Beach, California, and from Poughkeepsie, New York. I see you coming into the stream on tonight. Will you do me a favor? Will you weigh in wherever you are, whether you're coming in by way of Facebook, whether you're coming in, all right, from Huntington, West Virginia. I see you. I see you, uh, uh, Pastor Michael. I see you tonight. Amen. From uh, Port St. Lucie, Florida, uh, Jervy Harper, I see you on tonight. What a blessing to have you on the stream with us. Many blessings from Columbus, Ohio, Manor House in Columbus, Ohio. Some particular things happening in Columbus, Ohio coming up real soon. I'll, um, I'm not going to talk about them over the stream, but just know uh, there's some really, really important stuff happening uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Not only is it the place of my rearing and my hometown, uh, but there are some really important things that are coming uh, coming forth in Columbus and from uh, coming to Columbus, Ohio, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, Reading, Pennsylvania, Jacksonville, Florida, good. From the Chicagoland area, good, good, good. So good to see each and every one of you. The Lord be with you. Elder Judy, all the way from the booming metropolis of, of Decatur, Georgia, so good to have you all with us on tonight. Night. In Jesus' name, what a joy, what a joy and a privilege. Y'all know what we do. Tell a neighbor, tell a friend, tag and, and share and like and subscribe. Let somebody know Baltimore's in the house. Yes, indeed. Let somebody know. Dr. Jonathan Alvarado and the Global Pentecost Perspectives is on the live stream on tonight. And I am so looking forward to this uh, engagement with you on tonight. So you get ready, get ready, because we're going to talk about some important, important things on tonight. We're going to dialogue on some important matters. We're going to engage on some important things concerning our spirituality. We're going to be talking about uh, Pentecostal spirituality uh, and uh, a beginner's guide to Pentecostal spirituality. And we're going to be uh, hammering down some of the foundational dimensions of it. I'm going to be uh, sharing with you some insights, good, from others, uh, from some uh, some significant voices. I've already got some links in the description on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, so that way you can see the descriptions there and you can uh, you can see the, the links to the resources that are available to you that they give you some insight about some of the things we're talking about. Good. I see you all the way from uh, Washington, D.C. Good. And Bowie, Maryland is in place tonight. And Elder May, I see you on tonight as well. So many of you, thank you so very much for being on with us on tonight. Got a whole lot, a whole lot, uh, dear ones, that I want to accomplish on tonight. So I'm giving a moment or two for everybody that, that wants to get in from the get-go to be able to come in and get in with us. I'm always excited about my uh, my early adopters and and those that come in from the outset, those that uh, that make sure it's their priority to come in and to be a part of the broadcast from the very beginning. Thank you so very very much. So glad to see you. So glad to have you on the stream on tonight. A great privilege to see you and be with you on tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for continuing to weigh in and let me know where you're coming in from. As a blessing in the house on tonight. I've got some, uh, uh, you know, I want to be true to the origins of and uh, uh, GPP, and I want to be true to uh, Dr. Jonathan Alvarado, my own uh, way of being in the world as both a pastor and a teacher. Um, I want to be true to those things, and so I want to express them uh, tonight. I want to, uh, to fully express those by uh, sharing with you some of the some scholarly insights. I want to share with you some some uh, overlap between the pastoral uh, pastor theologian dimension, the kind of tension that we walk in as a pastor theologian, and I want to try to give you some some uh, perspective on uh, on this Pentecostal spirituality, a beginner's guide. So many people are asking so many questions. Uh, I, when I hear the questions, it, it warms my heart because there's interest, there's desire. There are people that are really interested in this spirituality that you and I enjoy on a regular basis. But there's oftentimes not a, a full understanding, not even a, a, a lay understanding of Pentecostal spirituality. Good. Yvette Williams, all the way from San Diego, California. Literally, y'all, we are stretching across this nation of ours and around the world. There are persons on the stream with us from 
uh, different parts of the country and different parts of the world. And I'm excited tonight to be able to bring this. Please tag, share, um, make it your business now. I know some of you, I'm not technologically savvy. Make it your business to share the post with somebody. Share on, if you're on Facebook or on YouTube, you can hit the share button right now and it'll put it out. If you're on YouTube, it'll put it out on your Twitter. It'll put it out on your Facebook. And I'd like for you to do that on tonight. It helps us to be able to spread the message, okay? And speaking of the message on tonight, I've got so many great and wonderful things that I'm going to share with you tonight, uh, but I want to appreciate you. Thank you so much for tuning in to Global Pentecostal Perspective. <laughs> Hey, this is Dr. Jonathan Alvarado, and I'm cordially and personally inviting you to a symposium on Pentecostal spirituality being hosted by the Greater Atlanta Theological Seminary and Global Pentecostal Perspectives on Pentecost weekend, Friday, May 21st, and Saturday, May 22nd, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time online. I want to encourage you to register and be a part of this life-changing event. We have wonderful guests, guest lecturers, and guest interlocutors that weekend in the persons of Dr. Estrelda Alexander of the William Seymour Foundation in Bowie, Maryland, the author of Black Fire, A History of Afro-Pentecostalism, and Dr. Ravi Waddell, New Testament scholar, early church historian, Pentecostal scholar in Southeastern University, Lakeland, Florida. They too will be with us on that weekend, instructing, encouraging, answering questions, and guiding us into this spirituality. You do realize that Pentecostal spirituality is the fastest growing spirituality of all the Christian traditions around the planet. You and I should be together on that weekend to dialogue, to discuss, to pray, and to hear from the Lord. Don't miss a symposium on Pentecostal spirituality, Pentecost weekend. Friday, May 21st, Saturday, May 22nd, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. both days, you may register at GATseminary.org. That's GATseminary.org. Click the registration button and you can register and we'll be together on Pentecost weekend for a symposium on Pentecostal spirituality. I hope to see you there. Indeed, I do. I hope to see each and every one of you there. Please register. This is the week of the event. This week, the event begins on this coming Friday night, the Friday of Pentecost weekend, Friday, May 21st, Saturday, May 22nd. This is the last week to register. Several of you have registered. Others of you have not. I want to encourage all of you to register and join me for that week. I did this. I'm doing tonight's uh, uh, interaction and engagement with you, this conversation on tonight with some dialogue partners. I, br I brought in some dialogue partners uh, that have written some things that are important for our, our Peru in our consideration. Uh, but um, we're doing so on tonight as a precursor and a preparatory moment for the symposium on Pentecostal spirituality. So please, ma'am, please, sir, make it your business, make it your priority to be a part of the symposium on this coming weekend, Friday night, the 20, or Friday, sorry, the 21st and Saturday, the 22nd of uh, May, we're going to be together in a symposium on Pentecost spirituality. All right? All right, good. Well, tonight I want to take the time. Question was raised when you say a guide, would this be a written guide? Uh, you know, y'all are, 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 are really uh, uh, encouraging and, uh, and, uh, uh, really a, a blessing to me. And uh, no, it's not a written guide because uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to pull this off as it is. Uh, yes. Um, yes, you can. Well, there is. You can register. Listen, great question, Bev. Uh, uh, can you register for one day? Listen, I don't have a one day price before the, the reduced price of what you're getting. Come on in and register for the Congress. I mean, register for the uh, register for the symposium. Come the one day that you can go on and get registered and 
come the one day that you, it's a ridiculously low price for registration. And so I want to encourage you to come. For you to be able to come in, I'm going to be instructing. Dr. Waddell is going to be instructing. Dr. Alexander is going to be instructing. And we'll be dialoguing. It's going to be on Zoom. So you'll be able to ask questions. You'll be there on the screen. It's not like you'll be looking at, at one person and, and not able to engage one with the other and, and, and engage in dialogue format. So I want to encourage you to do that. So yes, yes, yes. Please come on. Even if you can only come one day, come on and register. Uh, it will be a blessing in your life. All right. Uh, Pentecostal spirituality is a vast swath of information, which is why this is a beginner's guide. This is to get you thinking. This is to point you in the right direction. This is to give you some food for thought and some tools to be able to engage with this spirituality. All right. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you, doctora. Gracias. Muchas gracias. She said the quality of this video looks amazing. No, not new equipment. Um, uh, but uh, well, we're always uh, leveling up our uh, our our studio, our stream studio, and the like. Um, I just did a. Um, I don't know if it's on my. I can't remember if I put it on my YouTube channel or if I put it on the GPP Global Pentecostal Podcast. Um, my top five. Uh, I think it's on GPP. My top five uh, uh, tips for leveling up, for, for doing ministry in a digital environment. My top five tips for doing ministry in a digital environment. So I talked about leveling up your, uh, leveling up your, uh, your technical aspects of it. So that's one of the things. So check that out. Uh, check that out. Uh, the, the, that, uh, that video that I've done, I've already put it out there so you can check that out at, at your leisure. All right. Okay. So please, ma'am, please, sir, will it be recorded? I'm assuming you're talking about the symposium. Will it be recorded? Um, uh, no, it's not. The, the symposium will be recorded, but it'll be recorded for archive purposes. It's because uh, it's a paid registration. And so I'm, I'm maintaining it for the people that are, 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 are registered for Congress. OK. Um, and of course, I have had Dr. Alexander on as a guest before, and I will have in the future Dr. Waddell on GPP. And of course, that's our, that's the offering that we do just for whatever the people, the people are, are blessed and we want to bring add value to your life. We want to be a benefit and blessing. And so many of you all are so faithful uh, that come on and share and so gracious. And I am so grateful and appreciative to each and every one of you. Warren Wilcox, I see you all the way in from New Jersey. Thank you so, so very much. And so um, please, ma'am, please, sir, register for the symposium. It is forthcoming. That information, gatseminary.org. One click, register, fill out the information, pay your registration fee, and you're in and you'll be ready. Uh, my registrants are, that have already registered are going to get their information this week. They'll get schedule and the like. Yes, 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 you did. You got your ticket. Yes, you have it. And I'm ready, ready to engage with you. All right. Let me start tonight by talking about um, uh, a move from a real swift move. Uh, Dr. Marvin McMichael wrote a wonderful, uh, uh, little short, short little, uh, insight into the rise, uh, of, uh, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, the present day power of Pentecost, the rise and growth of black Pentecostalism in America. And so he runs this really, really swift gamut all the way through. And I want to talk to you. I want to, I want to, um, read his work. And then I'm going to share some of my own. I'm going to show you a video. I want to, I want to uh, uh, kind of vary it up a little bit on tonight. So track with me. And as always, um, if you have questions, write them down, reserve, maintain them in your mind. So that way, when we get to the end, uh, near the end, we can entertain questions and have some more dialogue. Okay. This is Marvin McMichael's work. This is not my own. I'll, I'll, I'll share some of my own momentarily. Okay. The phenomenal growth of, Pentec of the, uh, I'm sorry, the phenomenal growth of Pentecostal movements within African American communities has been one of the most significant developments in Christianity in the United States. It is safe to say that the history of African American Christianity can be divided into three phases of denominational influence: the Methodists in the 19th century, the Baptists in the 20th century, and Pentecostal groups in the 21st century. The 19th century was undoubtedly the century when various Methodist bodies held the most influence. The most dominant of them were the African Methodist Episcopal Church, founded in Philadelphia in 1816. The African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, founded in New York City 
in 1822, and the Christian, formerly colored, colored Methodist Episcopal Church, the CME, founded in Jackson, Tennessee, in 1870. The vast majority of Black leaders during the 19th century included Richard Allen, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Daniel Payne, Henry McNeil Turner, James Varick, and Sojourner Truth came from one of these Methodist bodies. The 20th century saw the emergence of several Black Baptist movements that eventually dwarfed their Methodist counterparts, both in sheer uh, membership numbers and in the influence they enjoyed on the national stage. The National Baptist Convention, which now has in excess of 5 million members in its affiliated congregations, was founded in 1895. The National Baptist Convention of America, with an additional 2 million members, was formed in 1915. And the Progressive National Baptist Convention was formed in 1961, accounting for another 1.5 million members. However, a new trend has been underway within Black communities across America a steady rise in both the numbers and influence of Pentecostal churches and their leaders. Pentecostalism entered the black community from two sources. One was the so-called holiness movement or the Wesleyan doctrine of sanctification. Two men were most responsible for the growth of the holiness movement among black Christians, Charles Harrison Mason and Charles Price Jones. Both of these men had been Baptist preachers, but they became convinced that justification, the forgiveness of sins, had to be followed up by sanctification, the living of a holy life made possible only by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Together, these two men formed the Church of God in Christ as a holiness movement in Memphis, Tennessee in 1897. The other contributing factor to the rise of Pentecostalism within African-American communities was the Azusa Street Revival that took place under the leadership of an African-American preacher named William Joseph Seymour in Los Angeles between 1906 and 1908. Charles Harrison Mason attended this revival in April of 1907, and while there, had what he described as a Pentecostal experience. OK, um, he subsequently came to believe in the central doctrine of being taught, being taught by Seymour and Charles Parham before him, which was the need for Christian conversion to go beyond justification and sanctification to experience the third act of grace, which was being baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues or the act of glossolalia as the ultimate evidence of one's salvation. By 1909, Mason and Jones, who had not attended Jones, who had not attended the uh, Azusa Street Revival, had parted company over the doctrine of Pentecostalism, and more particularly over the claim that being baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking with, in tongues was an essential part of the salvation process. Let me parenthetically interject that my recollection and understanding of it is earlier than 1909. I saw already in the uh, in the stream, 1897, the Church of God in Christ was started in 1907. That's what's on the charter, and that is exactly right. But it was started first in 1897 as a holiness movement. C.P. Jones, C.H. Mason together. C.H. Mason goes to the Azusa Street Revival in 1907, gets filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. C.P. Jones did not accompany him there, did not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit's experience as Mason did. And this begins the, uh, the Church of God in Christ Pentecostal in, eight, in 1907. They go through a kind of drag out uh, fight for the name, for the, con for the constituency, and Mason and the Pentecostal group wins out. Okay, so that's an important consideration. Dr. Harold Bennett is on here, who is the dean of the C.H. Mason School of Theology at uh, at uh, the ITC, the Interdenominational Theological Center. And so I'm glad I'm glad that you're raising the question. I'm glad that you're asking. 18, uh, 1897, yes, but but we've got to understand the Church of God in Christ Pentecostal was established in 1907. Uh, behind the parting of the ways, a uh, theological parting of the ways of C.H. Mason and C.P. Jones, okay? C.P. Jones 
uh, went on to establish Holiness Movement and carries on uh, uh, along the wise great hymn writer and uh, 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 and uh, a great uh, theologian in his own right. Uh, but the Pentecostal movement is what we're talking about here. Okay. All right. Good. 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 Thank you for saying so. I appreciate your affirmation, Doctor Bennett. I can keep going now. Uh, what? But I want to say that because. Um, Doc McMickel, in his in his very brief uh, article, uh, uses 1909 as the date. And while I agree that some of the wranglings and goings on carried on uh, for a couple of years, uh, the the establishment of the Church of God in Christ Pentecostal was indeed in 1907. All right, all right. Mason allowed was allowed to continue using the name Church of God in Christ, and he eventually transformed that Holiness movement into a, into the single largest Pentecostal movement in the African American community. He also continued to be the presiding bishop of that movement until his death in 1961. It is interesting to consider how different U.S. history could have been if the work and vision of Mason and the Pentecostal movement that he founded had been able to take root. Upon his return to Memphis from the Azusa Street Revival, Mason was the only Pentecostal leader in the United States with a legally incorporated church denomination that allowed him to ordain others as clergy in the Pentecostal movement. Stay with me on this. That's going to be an important consideration. Thus, from 1909 to 1914, Mason was the leader of an interracial religious body headquartered in Memphis. And he exercised oversight and authority over more than 300 white Pentecostal preachers who had been ordained into the ministry through the Church of God in Christ. Let's be abundantly clear. Hear his claim. Hear the history. C.H. Mason's establishment of the Church of God in Christ was the only legally incorporated church. Pentecostal church denomination, giving him the legal right to ordain men and women. Listen to me carefully. At that time, people weren't flying around the country. And because of the enthusiasm of the Azusa Street Revival, people wanted to travel to evangelize, to share this Pentecostal message. Because part of the essence of Pentecostalism, if you're taking careful notes or thinking about this carefully, write this down. One of the main impulses of Pentecostal, Pentecostalism in a, a, a beginner's guide to Pentecostal spirituality is the missionary impulse. The idea that once one is baptized in the Holy Spirit, one goes to share the gospel. Okay? And there were a considerable number of white Pentecostals who had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, either directly from the hands of William Seymour or one of his agents at the Azusa Street Revival or from others who had been to the Azusa Street Revival. So Pentecostalism was germinating as in its fountainhead, Los Angeles, California, William J. Seymour, the Azusa Street Revival. So in order for them to evangelize around the country, they had to have ordination to get reduced price rail passes. At that time, clergymen could get rail passes at discounted rate if they held legitimate ordination from a legally recognized church body. The reality is that the only Pentecostal uh, organization that was recognized by the United States government at that time was the Church of God in Christ. Therefore, many white persons, ministers, came to receive credentials from C.H. Mason, Mason, affectionately known to most of my Church of God in Christ brethren as Dad Mason. And he gave credentials to many of them, he said, to men who were of upstanding character, who believed and taught the true gospel, which was salvation by Jesus Christ, the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And to those persons, he gave credentials. Numbers, as McMickle has, is saying, is over 300. We know for certain that 154 ministers came together out of Arkansas that needed ordination. And Mason sent signed ordained, ordination certificates with a few of them as a delegation to give to worthy men to be able to carry out the gospel. And that group became the Assemblies of God. 
with their first president, E. N. Bell, Eudorphus N. Bell, established in 1914, having received their the majority of their credentials from C. H. Mason. So ostensibly, Bishop C. H. Mason is the ostensible father of the Assemblies of God. The first of their ministers began as Church of God in Christ ministers, which is why Assemblies of God and Church of God in Christ polity and doctrinal statements are extraordinarily similar. The Church of God, in, I mean, the Assemblies of God have, have since, in their development, moved more toward a Keswick understanding of salvation and sanctification as a fourfold rather than fivefold work. And Church of God in Christ has retained a more Wesleyan holiness approach to sal salvation. It's important that we understand this history because this history sets the record straight. I have precious friends, some of whom are probably watching the live stream on tonight, who have said to me, having grown up as cradle assemblies of God and gone to an assemblies of God undergraduate institution and perhaps even to the assembly AGTS, the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, and did not hear of this history till they got in graduate or, or sometimes postgraduate work. And I'm a man of truth. I'm just committed to the truth. I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth of the matter. And that is that Bishop C.H. Mason credentialed about 154 of the original ministers of the Church of God in Christ and other denominations, but I mean, of, of, of the Assemblies of God, excuse me, and other denominations. And for a, a good bit of the earlier foundational years of both the Church of God in Christ and the Pentecostal movement in general, there it was a very integrated movement. There were white persons that were part of the Church of God in Christ, and there certainly are, as we will see momentarily, white persons in the Azusa Street revival, all right? Let me keep going uh, so, so I don't lose uh, too much time here. All right. Like the Azusa Street Revival of 1906 to 1908 that had a tremendous interracial following, Mason and his largely African-American Pentecostal movement were breaking down the walls of racial division through the power of the Holy Spirit, just as happened after Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. However, the prevailing racial policies of the United States at that time seemed to take precedence over the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, over the work the Holy Spirit was attempting to accomplish. That was, after all, the zenith of the influence of the Ku Klux Klan, which was then centered in the state of Tennessee. That was also the period when African Americans were being lynched at a rate of one or two per day throughout the South. Everything that the Holy Spirit seemed to have set in motion through the emergence of the Pentecostal movement among African Americans was now being threatened. Unable to accept the authority and oversight of an African-American bishop, all of the white clergy members of the Church of God in Christ, both clergy and laity, withdrew from that body in 1914. They joined with other smaller white Pentecostal groups to form a new and almost entirely white Pentecostal group now known as the Assemblies of God which was then headquartered in Hot Springs, Arkansas. The interracial fellowship that formed at the height of the Jim Crow era in the U.S. in U.S. history would have been a great opportunity for the united witness that the Christian community in the United States could have offered to a racially divided society. There is a verse in the Civil Rights Anthem, We Shall Overcome, that says, Black and White Together. When those words were sung in the 1950s and 1960s, it seemed to speak of that partnership as some kind of future possibility. What most Americans do not know is that we had that opportunity within our grasp nearly a century ago when black and white Pentecostals came together around the ministry of Charles Harris Mason and the Church of God in Christ. Sadly, rampant, vicious racial prejudice caused that spirit-filled opportunity to slip away. And do we not see it continuing to slip through the grasps of the hands of men and women of goodwill? Even today. 
despite the division within the Pentecostal movement, the growth of that movement within the African African American communities is nothing short of phenomenal. At, and most of that growth has occurred within the last 20 to 30 years. The membership of the Church of God in Christ now exceeds 5 million, making it at least as large as the National Baptist Convention Incorporated. That was at the date of the writing of this article, which is about 15 to 20 years ago. And so the Church of God in Christ is now over 6 million members. Okay. However, while the total membership of the National Baptist Convention USA has remained static for the last 30 years, the Church of God in Christ has been the single fastest growing religious group among African Americans. One other group bears mention in any discussion of African Americans in the Pentecostal movement, and that is the Full Gospel Baptist Fellowship under the leadership of Bishop Paul Sylvester Morton Sr. This fusion of the Baptist Church with the Pentecostal movement seemed almost inevitable. Paul Morton's grandfather was among the founders and early leaders of the Church of God in Christ. In 1975, Morton became the pastor of the Greater St. Stephen's Baptist Church in New Orleans. Over the years, Morton oversaw the transitioning of a traditional Baptist church into a new community that was marked by casting out demons, laying hands on the sick, and speaking in heavenly languages. By 1994, Bishop Morton saw his blending of Baptist doctrine and Pentecostal fervor grow from a single congregation in New Orleans to a national fellowship that annually had over 50,000 delegates from member congregations around a, a gathering in New, the New Orleans Superdome for a holy convocation. The combination of the Church of God in Christ, the Full Gospel Baptist Fellowship, along with the United Pentecostal Churches of Christ, and the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World clearly rank Pentecostalism as the largest and fastest growing Christian movement in the African American community. As in Acts 2.47, the Lord has been adding daily to their churches those who are being saved. I think that this history needs to be augmented to understand that Pentecostals and their first, our first cousins, Charismatics, uh, and African indigenous churches, and, and churches of indigenous spirituality that are, 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 are spiritualist churches and the like are oftentimes categorized within the context of Pentecostals because of the shared spirituality. I told you one of the tenets of that spirituality is the missionary impulse. We've read in the article that one of the tenets of that spirituality is its enchanted nature. Tongue speech depicts at least two dimensions. One is enchantment, otherworldliness, mystical outworkings of the power of God that defy rationality and empirical evidence. The other uh, prong to speaking in tongues is another dimension of Pentecostal spirituality. I'm talking about a beginner's guide to Pentecostal spirituality. Remember, I've got links in the uh, in the I've got links in the description that will help you. I've got links of books that will help you. Books like Wolfgang Fandi's uh, Pentecostalism, A Guide for the Perplexed. That's a primer on Pentecostalism. Books like Mel Roebuck's uh, The Azusa Street Revival and Mission. They give you the history of the Azusa Street Revival. Books like Vincent Sinan's Holiness Pentecostal Movement in the United States. Okay, these are these are books that will give you the kind of historical and theological uh, 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 on ramp to be able to begin this trajectory because this is a beginner's guide to Pentecostal spirituality. But as I was saying before, this spirituality is shared by men and women from various and sundry uh, uh, walks of life and and uh, ecclesial and theological persuasions. And the reason that that is is because Pentecostalism transposable. It's culturally transposable, more so perhaps than some of the evangelical imperialist colonial leanings of and missionary impulse of some of the colonizing uh, mission, uh, some of the colonizing um, uh, missionaries that came in and exported culture rather than importing Christ into culture. Okay, it's a whole nother dynamic that I don't have time to talk about necessarily on tonight. But I do want to talk about the beginnings 
of Pentecostal spirituality, a beginner's guide to Pentecostal spirituality. So you've heard at least three things, the missionary impulse, embodiment, enchantment. We'll say a couple more before the end of our time. I want to talk particularly about worship on tonight because Pentecostalism fleshes itself out most fully, I believe, in seasons of worship. But in this moment, what I'd like to do is take a moment or two to talk about the progenitor of the modern-day Pentecostal movement, the father of the Pentecostal movement here in the United States and abroad, in the person of William Jefferson Seymour. For those in life that look set out to succeed, practically, socially, culturally, financially, William J. Seymour was not one of those people. In fact, for him, it seemed like the very opposite. Son of a slave, blind in one eye, a young black man living in an intense racist environment, life didn't look like it was in his favor. Yet God used him, and he became one of the most influential African-American Christian leaders of his time, and his impact can still be felt today. Seymour was born on the 2nd of May, 1870, in Louisiana, and his parents, Simon and Phyllis, were both recently freed slaves. Not much is known of his younger years, but later he escaped the harsh prejudice of Louisiana to live in Cincinnati. However, there he suffered a bout of smallpox, and the attack caused him to lose his left eye. Amazingly, his recovery from the potentially fatal illness actually compelled him to become a preacher. He grew an unwavering fascination to experience the Holy Spirit, he was hungry for finding the truth and had a passion to share it, both of which fueled his travels to a great number of different cities. Seymour soon had a desire to become a student at a Bible school in Texas and sought to join the classes. But because segregation was still happening, they would not provide him with a seat in the class. Instead, he was only allowed to listen to an open door or window. His attendance did not last very long as he grew sick of the racism. He believed that racial integration in worship was the true heart of Christ. However, from the teaching he did here, he realized the power that was the Holy Spirit and what it meant for him. Seymour was led to move to Los Angeles, where he wasted no time in making his presence felt. A kind couple called Mr. and Mrs. Asbury offered to host some gatherings in their home where Seymour could preach and pray. And on April the 9th, 1906, God began doing something in the hearts of people that was wild and real and they continued for three nights. As excitement increased about these events taking place, more and more people came to witness the meetings, and the Asbury home quickly became too small to accommodate the services. So, Seymour moved the congregation into an unused church building on Azusa Street, which was, at the time, being used as a warehouse. The congregation, made up of people of all races, cleaned out the building and then filled the interior with makeshift furnishings. The pulpit was made of two boxes nailed together, and the seats made from planks nailed to empty barrels. Seymour made his home on the floor above the church and began holding services three times a day, seven days a week. A diverse array of volunteers helped assist the gatherings, black and white, men and women. It gained national attention as the Azusa Street Revival and was a huge catalyst for the expansion of the Pentecostal movement across the world. The Azusa Street Revival was always filled beyond capacity as it attracted more than a thousand people a day and had a reputation for wild scenes of passion and prayer. People were amazed that Seymour, from his unlikely and humble beginning, had realized his vision of a completely integrated church community alive with the Spirit of God. So, friends, you can see that Pentecostal spirituality began, as we've described, with a missionary impulse, with enchantment, with embodiment. I'm talking about a beginner's guide to Pentecostal spirituality. But also, as you heard there, it began in, in, with interracial sensibilities and, as we will discover, with egalitarian gender sensibilities. So if we're going to talk about Pentecostalism, the Pentecostal movement in the codification of its spirituality and practices, those things were established in the movement within the first decade, perhaps 15 years of the movement. 
From 1906 to 1916, 1906 perhaps to 1920, 1921, the, the, the establishment of the spirituality and the codification of the trajectory of the movement was established. It was established experientially rather than doctrinally. It was established in narrative and testimonial ways, meaning that people would have experiences, they would share their testimony, which oftentimes turned into exhortation, which oftentimes turned into preaching. And, th and in so doing, those impulses became the foundational work, the foundational substratum, perhaps the foundation itself of the entire movement. Now, while there had been movements around the planet of others that had minor outbreaks of tongue speech, ecstatic expression, ways of, of enchanted engagements with the Holy Spirit, none were as sustained, none were as visible, none were as, as catalyzing as the Azusa Street Revival which was led by a one-eyed, differently educated black son of former slaves in the person of William Joseph Seymour. I emphasize this because there has been a major move afoot as Pentecostalism has gained traction and has become the dominant spirituality of Christian spiritualities around the planet to repristinate the origins of American, North American uh, Pentecostalism, which has influenced so much of Pentecostalism around the world through its missionary impulses. Though others, because of the transposability of Pentecostal spirituality, other cultures have been able to embrace it without breaks, and, and, and like in, in in South Korea and in and in various other parts of the world, there have been outbreaks earlier and in similar time frames as the early 1900s, but none have been the fountainhead of Pentecostalism like the Azusa Street Revival, which was headed up by William J. Seymour. As much as I do not want to call his name in this, the name that you'll hear oftentimes to reassign fatherhood of movement will be to that of Charles Fox Parham. I even saw Dr. Bennett, one of our precious colleagues, has written a book and has definitively uh, proclaimed by edict or fiat or historical uh, uh, research, as they have called it, that, that Parham was, is the father of the movement. I'd like to suggest that though he did have influence on Seymour, and though he was one of the earlier ones to, uh, to proclaim, to articulate uh, uh, the fundamental tenet of the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that of tongue speech. No doubt about it, Charles Fox Parham. But God did not use Parham to establish the movement as he did Seymour. So Parham was not, you're asking the question and I am definitively saying, Parham was not the father of the movement. The major, many persons, I won't say the majority because I don't know where uh, a lot of scholarly opinion is on that right now, but I know a great deal of scholarly opinion assigns the fatherhood of the Pentecostal movement to William Joseph Seymour. And I think rightly so, because this is the term that I use, the fountainhead of Pentecostalism, particularly in the North American continent and all of its missionary tributaries, was established at the Azusa Street Revival. Charles Fox Parham had a school in Topeka, Kansas, in Houston, Texas. William Seymour was allowed to sit on the outside and listen in, so he did hear some of the Bible instruction, and perhaps uh, his impulse for tongue speech was developed in that in that time. Absolutely, I have no qualms with that. But the enacting of that and the actual outpouring of that was at the Azusa Street Revival, 1906, under William Seymour. Seymour sought to include Parham. But when Parham saw that it was an interracial movement, he railed against it. 
and upon with Bishop with with uh, uh, Elder Seymour's invitation when he came and saw Seymour invited him to come preach and teach. And when he saw that, he railed against the interracial nature of the movement. And his racist impulses and tendencies came out. If you look at the earlier apostolic faith newsletters that were produced by the Azusa Street Mission, you'll see that Parham was included as uh, William Seymour's overseer. But later on, in 1907, right about the top of 1907, he was removed. From, from the uh, Azusa Street, uh, from the Apostolic Faith Messenger. He was removed from it because when he came out, he and William Durham and several other white Pentecostals at that time tried to, because the, the, the movement was so dynamic and vibrant and vital, they tried to come and take it over. And Seymour recognized that it was his stewardship. Azusa Street was the seminal event of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the fountainhead of North American Pentecostalism. And so I agree, Seymour was the father of the movement. This is an important consideration. It seems to me that some of our white brothers and sisters are seeking to uh, give a particular place to Parham that I, I believe is, is both historically inaccurate and psychologically damaging, as if th there's no contributions that we as persons of color have made to this broader schema. And now that it's the fastest, the fastest growing, the numerically going to be the largest, I mean, we're rivaling, we're now coming up in terms of global Christianity, 7.2 to 7.5 billion people on the planet, 2.1, 2.2 billion of them are now uh, uh, Christian, 2.2 billion persons on the planet, 2.1, 2.2 billion of 7.2, 7.5 billion persons on the planet are Christian. The rival going back and forth, who's bigger, Islam or Christianity? And all the Christians say it's Christianity, the Muslims say it's Islam. The point that I'm making is Pentecostalism represents a full one-third coming up to one-half of all Christians on the planet. Now, this is an important consideration because we haven't had 20 centuries to do this. We are, Pentecostalism, the modern Pentecostal movement, is only a bit over 100 years old. So all of this growth and expanse has taken place within the last 100 years of the 2,000-year history of the church. That's significant. And not only have we grown, we've grown fast. And we've grown, when allowed to, grown, grown in, in cultural iterations that have adaptable spirituality, that see their spirituality. You see, when white colonial missionaries came to Africa, they told Africans that the way that they expressed their spirituality through dance and embodiment and trance and vision had to be completely stopped. So their culture had no place in white missionary religion, Christianity. But Pentecostalism, birthed out of African spirituality, is welcoming of the kind of ecstatic, enchanted expression that is African spirituality. It connects with our most primal impulses, and it, it germinates out of our natural spirituality. And that is the spirituality that influenced the whole movement. And that's why white and black, when people are baptized in the Holy Spirit and are Pentecostal in their spirituality and practice, they we all behave in similar ways. Uh, there are cultural adjustments and tweaking. We might not shout the exact same way. We may not, we might not embody the spirit in exactly the same way, but we all embody the spirit. We may not all speak with tongues in the same way, but we all speak with tongues, or many of us speak with tongues. These are important considerations. We're thinking about the, uh, a beginner's guide to Pentecostal spirituality. Well, one of the major, major dimensions uh, of, of Pentecostal spirituality is in the area of worship. You see, the Azusa Street Revival was so because it was a prayer meeting, a dimension of worship, preaching, a dimension of worship, deliverance, a dimension of worship, and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which is a very sacramental dimension of worship. And so the Azusa Street Revival represented a fundamental shift in worship. 
from a Western European model to a more primal, and as Walter Hollenweger, I put his, a link to Hollenweger's seminal work, Walter Hollenweger in the 1960s wrote, in the 1970s wrote uh, Pentecostalism, which is a very uh, thick, uh, strong, I mean, seminal work, seminal uh, academic work on Pentecostalism. Okay, Walter J. Hollenweger. And so I put the link to his text in the in the description below as well. Okay. So Pentecostalism, another dimension of we're talking about Pentecostal spirituality, another key dimension is Pentecostal worship. All right. Let me so I'm gonna say a couple of things along that wise. I, now this this work that I'm about to em, embark on is mine. I read McMickle's work earlier, and this is mine. The Azusa Street, the worship of the Azusa Street Revival was a great departure from the worship of many churches ex existent at the beginning of the 20th century. It represented a fundamental shift from the norm of Christian worship up to that point in American religious history. Though its practices were deeply rooted in the worship traditions of African-American slave religion and American revivalism, its adherents reinterpreted Azusa Street worship and gave new meaning to Christian devotion, tongue speech, and ecstatic behavior. Historians and theologians are now beginning to recognize the shifts in tides, shifts in tides of worship represented in the Azusa Street Revival. Also, they are, they are now beginning to recognize the theological and interpretive shifts that the spirituality of Azusa Street necessitates in order to be fully understood. Thus, Azusa Street worship has emerged as the paradigm for Pentecostal charismatic spirituality in North America. This essay analyzes the worship of the Azusa Street Revival, seeking to discover its shifting spirituality and its influence upon subsequent Pentecostal-like movements. The analysis of its tenets and practices served to move the conversation toward an African-American Pentecostal theology of worship. The term Pentecostal should be understood in the broadest possible terms whenever I use it. Its usage will encompass classical Pentecostals, neo-Pentecostals, and charismatics. This essay seeks to explore what gaps in scholarship can be identified and what areas of inquiry require future scholarly attention. It seeks to answer the question, what aspects of, the Azusa, Street, of Azusa Street worship need to be theologically reinterpreted in light of the shifting spirituality that Azusa Street worship represents. The purpose of this essay is to describe Azusa Street worship and reinterpret that description for the Pentecostal movements throughout the 20th century. I see your comments. I see y'all. Yes, uh, that that is the Holland Vega book. Yes, in my church history class, seminary, uh, Parham is still being taught as the father of Pentecostalism. Myself and others valiantly tried to dispute this. There's so much misinformation. Let me suggest that you get um, uh, Colette, uh, let me suggest that you get, um, look it up in Atla, um, uh, Dr. Leonard J. Lovett wrote an article on the, uh, African-American origins of, Pen of Pentecostalism, where he addresses that forthrightly. Get Vincent Sinan's, uh, work. Sinan has been very generous. And then finally, this is not in uh, this book I'm about to tell you is not in the in the link below, although I'll edit, I'll edit it later on and, and make a link to know. Gaston Espinosa did a work on William J. Seymour. That's an important, important work for, for the conversation. Okay. So it really, really bolsters these things I'm telling you now. Uh, you know, I want to say this delicately, but when history is written, if we're not careful, history can be written in a way that gives particular posture to ones uh, for the maintenance of their, their own power. Now, listen, let me pause right here to say, if you are get, driving any value out of this, I want you to like and subscribe. I'm glad that was helpful. Good, 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 good. Dr. Lovett has gone to heaven. He was your dear friend, Martha Taylor. I did. Oh, I'm glad to know that. I'm glad to know that. Bless your sweetheart. He was a wonderful, he's right here in Atlanta, he's a great man of God. He was the founding dean, Dr. Bennett, of the, uh, of the Mason School there at ITC. And one of the early Pentecostal scholars, 
out of the Church of God in Christ. Leonard, love it. But if you're deriving any value out of this, like, subscribe to, share. Please consider every way possible that you can support uh, 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 the Global Pentecostal Perspectives. And one of the ways you could do so is by registering for the Symposium on Pentecostal Spirituality. This is what I did this session tonight as a precursor to what's going to happen on Friday and Saturday in a more protracted way. You'll get a CEU of credit from the Greater Atlanta Theological Seminary. You won't get academic credit, but you will get continuing education credit. You'll get a CEU, a continuing education unit, for the 10 hours that we'll spend together on Friday and Saturday in uh, deliberation with two, with, with two Pentecostal scholars and myself to be a part of uh, helping to advance and elevate you along that wise. It's our desire and our hope to be able to do so. So, the, uh, so I'm asking you to like, to subscribe, to share, and if 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 you're deriving value out of this, listen, and you want to support the 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 the, the GPP, uh, Doctor Alvarado, I can't be there on Friday or Saturday. If you can be there either day, register and come. I can't be there Friday or Saturday, but I can support you. I can support the channel. I would encourage you to do so tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're deriving any value out of what we're teaching on tonight and how we're engaging. And your engagement has been extremely valuable. Thank you for doing so. Good, 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 good. All right. Um, the, the, uh, the, the essay will provide the readers with a perspective on a, on a theology of Azusa Street worship that builds upon the descriptive works already in dialogue with each other and in several scholarly conversations. It will chronicle the events and the historical development of Azusa Street worship in order to proffer a theological contribution that is narrative in its methodology. Finally, the scope of this essay does not permit a full expiation of all the nuanced distinctions within the matrix of Pentecostal theology, Pentecostal worship, African-American worship, Afro-Pentecostalism, and ritual studies. However, it will synthesize the principal voices that have written thus far and build upon their contributions to the study in order to reinterpret the outcomes and provide possible solutions and trajectories for future research of the question at hand. Let's begin with a brief overview of some of the, of, of some of the literature that has been written on African-American and African-American Pentecostal worship as one of the primary impulses of Pentecostal spirituality. Elder May, I see, when European missionaries first went to Africa, they underrated the place of African spirituality for fear that they would undermine or subvert their own goal to westernize African Christianity. Yes and amen. And as a missionary who spent three decades on the continent of Africa and in 55 uh, countries around the world, having worked in those many countries, uh, I know that that is a truism and I know that you're expert in your witness along that wise. Let's talk about a couple of pieces of literature, several pieces of literature that are that influence this essay, okay? The cultural and theological moorings of African-American church music are deeply rooted in the cultural traditions of Africa and the diaspora, coupled with the folk religious practices of African slaves in America. Thus, African-Americans are a musical and effervescent people who celebrate the whole of life in story, in song, in dance, and in drama. This religious celebration of life takes on spiritually formative characteristics in the holiness and Pentecostal traditions of worship. In order for one to understand the depth of these roots within the holiness and Pentecostal tradition, one must examine the history of effect of the music and worship within the African-American holiness and Pentecostal traditions. The issue of worldview figures prominently as a consideration for African slaves and their descendants. They tended to view life from a communal perspective, thoroughly saturated with African values and attitudes. Much of those ingrained values and attitudes unconsciously shape the worldview of African Americans. Because Azusa Street worship was led by an African American and largely attended by African American worshipers, it stands to reason that African American sensibilities shaped the worship of the, of the apostolic faith mission and influenced Azusa Street worship practices. Pentecostal historian Cecil M. Roebuck Jr. even paralleled Azusa Street worship with Davidic worship and the worship of African slaves in America, highlighting the significance of impact of African Americans had on the movement. Again, his book is uh, The Azusa Street Mission and Revival, and it is in the link below. You can get a copy of it. 
Okay. African-Americans also resisted the propensity to bifurcate between the sacred and the secular. That worldview undergirded and impacted the way African-Americans worshipped then, and it impacts how African-Americans worship today. You know, sometimes we have adopted a real uh, westernized notion of what is sacred and what is secular. And an African worldview that influenced much of Pentecostal spirituality is, an, is a worldview that, that sees all of life as sacred. All of life as a gift from God. Every dimension of life as an outworking of an engagement and interaction with a transcendent God who is imminent while, while transcendent so far from us, yet imminent so close to us, involved in the daily affairs of human beings. The most prolific of all the voices contributing to African-American worship in general is that of Melva Wilson Coston. The frequency of her citations uh, uh, the frequency of citations of her work distinguishes her as the recognized expert in African-American worship. In her magnum opus, she asserts that a theology of African-American worship was forged under the power of the Spirit, being shaped and expressed as the community worshiped. She argues that this theology was a folk theology that was deeply rooted in the traditional African religions and the slave religious experience of Africans in America. The religious existence of Africans in America was informed and nurtured by their roots that connected all Africans of the diaspora to traditional Africa in some tangential way. She asserts that African-American folk theology stands in stark contrast to the epistemological framework of Western worship theology so heavily influenced by Platonic thinking and practiced by Europeans in America. Rather, an African-American theology of worship, such as was emerging in the Azusa Street Revival, prefers experience, knowing God, and encounter above creeds and dogmas. Coston sees African-American worship as a response to God's presence and frequent intervention in the affairs of humans. Remember, I talked about that eminence. This is what we're talking about frequent interventions into the affairs of humans. This is the idea of sacralizing of all life, all life sacred, because God intervenes. She asserts that African Americans generally acknowledge the presence of Jesus Christ in the worship by the power of the Holy Spirit, and therefore are compelled to respond to his presence in acts of worship. The slave phenomenon that Africans in America endured has shaped their worship and framed it within a context of oppression and marginalization. Thus, for African Americans, encounter with the divine tends to have overtones that speak of the liberating power and spirit of a kind and just God in the face of human indignity. So I'm drawing a distinction now between how African Americans approach the same God that our European counterparts approach, but we approach that God from the perspective of and the vantage point of oppression and marginalization. Okay, I see several of you all. Uh, I see some of you all that are that are that are putting uh, the uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, some of the the books there. I want you to first first. Consider the things that I have in the description, because when you when you click on the links that are in the description that I've provided for you, you help the channel. OK, so get the titles, but first check it out in the description. That'll be helpful to us. All right. All right. Cost Melville Winston, Wilson Coston also taught at the ITC. She was a Presbyterian woman, but she has written the definitive work on the magnum opus, in my estimation, on African-American uh, uh, worship. And thus she's, she's cited thusly by many, many uh, scholars of worship and has, has, has been a major, major contributor along that wise. And she speaks of, from her Presbyterian vantage point, how African-American worship was the worship of Jesus Christ under the power of the Holy Spirit. Consider that. Pneumatology is not a highly featured dimension of Presbyterian theology. Yet, as an African American, she understood how important spiritual and enchanted otherworldly impulses are for African American spirituality, which influenced Pentecostal spirituality that imbibes those same, those same spiritual impulses. The idea that the Holy Spirit 
is at work. That's why you can go to a Methodist, Black Methodist church or Black Baptist church or, or a Black Pentecostal church and oftentimes see some of the same behaviors and the same appreciations and the same uh, sensibilities being on display because our desire is to see the power of the Holy Spirit. Our African sense, spiritual sensibilities call on uh, the, the, the enchanted, mystical, divine engagement and encounter with the Spirit. Worshiping Jesus Christ under the power of the Spirit. Okay? Costin asserts that a theology of, res of response has been axiomatic in the, in the history of African American worship, whether that worship was Christian or not. Listen to it. A theology of response has been axiomatic for African spirituality, whether that worship was Christian or not. Albert Rabateau narrated a similar notion and proffered accounts of African response as worship in non-religious, non-Christian religious traditions. So in other words, the idea of response to the spirit world is an African spiritual concept that was transposed into Christian practice. It is not indigenously Christian, it's indigenously African. The idea of spiritual response. For Africans, uh, for African Americans, a divine encounter solicited, even necessitated, a response in worship that often climaxed in ecstasy, spiritual manifestations, or even divinization. Thus, this has been the modus operandi of African American worshipers through the centuries, and it reached its pinnacle, the pinnacle of its expression, in the Azusa Street Revival. Another significant contribute to contributor to African-American worship studies is Brenda Eatman Agahoa. As an associate minister in the congregational church and an observer of religious ritual and tradition, Agahoa contributes a carefully nuanced analysis of the worship of two black congregations within predominantly white denominations. In so doing, she not only captures the essence of black worship, but she couches it in the context of identity pres preservation and cultural awareness. This is what makes her work a valuable lens through which to view Azusa Street worship. The Apostolic Faith Mission, the home of the Azusa Street Revival, was birthed and being raised up within a culture of segregation, marginalization, and oppression of blacks and minorities. Yet it found liberating expression of worship as a response to the power and baptism of the Spirit. As much as it was a spiritual expression, it was also an expression of identity preservation. Agahoa articulates her understanding of worship as God's service to human beings and human beings' service to God. She sees this reciprocating understanding of worship to be broad enough to capture the multifaceted nature of Christian worship, wherein God visits his people, transforms and empowers them. Empowerment was the theological tenet most emphasized by the Azusa Street worshipers. The Spirit has come to give the church power for warfare and witness. The people then should in turn worship him in the gathered corporate community. They should also continue in worship through acts of service to the larger community, empowered by the Spirit through the encounter with the Almighty God. Thus, worship for Agahoa is a reciprocating exercise. I see some of you all already. I see some of you. I see you. You already talk about how it's call and response. Yes, it is. It's reciprocating. The call and response is just the embodied expression of the reciprocating spirituality between God and people, between people and leader, between pe people and people within the con context of the congregation, and between God and church. Another important observation that she makes, Agahoa makes, concerning worship is the danger of what she calls liturgical imperialism. She defines liturgical imperialism as the superimposition of white cultural worship practices upon black or any other ethnic groups worshiping congregation that values the style and form of white liturgy over and above ethnic liturgy to the point of making white liturgy the standard or normative. 
This was the basis of much of the criticism leveled against Azusa Street worship. Liturgical imperialism was that basis. Agahoa contends that this happens all too often as in, and is injurious to all congregations, but especially to minority congregations. This historical trend of liturgical superimposition of what is quote-unquote good or quote-unquote correct can even expand to making white standards of what is quote-unquote moral or quote-unquote orthodox or even quote-unquote politically correct, the norm, if left unchecked. And that, my friends, is what is happening today. The standards of normality, whiteness has been normalized as orthodox, correct, godly, Christian. And other ways of being in the world have been demonized as, as not, not uh, substandard, subpar, antichrist, antithetical, antibiblical. And now because we've married white normativity to the cultural standards of the country, we've made being a the accepting white normativity as being a good American and being a good American as being a good Christian. Whereas there are so many other uh, cultural impulses that fuel Pentecostal spirituality that by its very nature, it rails against the normalizing of whiteness as the normal, uh, as the uh, modicum or, or as the, uh, as the, uh, the example of Christian spirituality par excellence. And that's important for us to consider. It's so important for us to realize. And this happens all too often in what Agahoa calls liturgical imperialism, where we adopt white standards of worship. I'm always amazed in predominantly black congregations when a group of white people show up. We behave differently. We act all differently. Some pastors even get up there and say, don't y'all embarrass me. Come on. Y'all stop shouting. Sit up, sit up. Get yourself together. Making jokes out of it. Y'all don't, don't embarrass me. We got guests. We got guests. That's code speech for white folk looking, y'all. I'm amazed by that. I'm amazed by that. So, Carl, uh, another, okay, so Carlisle Fielding Stewart III significantly contributes, here's, I'm moving to another author now, to an understanding of African-American Christian worship in his book, Soul Survivors, an African-American spirituality. In it, he asserts that African-American worship is a spiritual and cultural exercise toward human freedom that is connected to African ritual roots and empowered with what he calls soul force. Carlisle Fielding Stewart. Now listen to me carefully. I, I, I got I to move fast. I got to get ready to bring, bring it to a close. I won't get anywhere near done with this. But I think this is important. Carlisle Fielding Stewart says that African-American spiritual worship, African-American worship is a spiritual and cultural exercise. Now I want to say this about Pentecostal worship, that I agree and that its roots in African-American worship make Pentecostal worship as a major tenet of understanding Pentecostal spirituality. It is both a spiritual and a cultural exercise. I earlier spoke of the cultural transposability of Pentecostal spirituality, how it transposes to various cultures very easily, that, the, that, that there's not a whole lot of that there's not a whole lot of contortion that needs to take place to the culture or to the spiritual expression, that they mesh and work. Pentecostal spirituality engages people where they are. This is an important, significant consideration, precious dears. And I think that it is one that's been understated because our, our European Christian liturgical and, and, and doctrinal imperialism colonizing Christianity has made purity tests for orthodoxy based upon standards of white normativity that automatically disqualify persons made in the image of God from being able to ascend unto or attain unto those that, that particular normative spirituality. I will never be white. And it, since that is in many of their minds, the standard for Christian normativity, 
then I have to talk in a way that makes them comfortable, dress in a way, worship in a way, engage in a way, believe in a way that makes them comfortable, that acquiesces to and denies my own spiritual self-agency in the planet. And as I just this, this is a, the scratching the surface. This is a beginner's guide to Pentecostal spirituality. One of the, another tenet of Pentecostal spirituality is spiritual self agency. The liberative power of the Spirit to put you in touch with not only the God who is above us, but the God who is within us. That we are liberated, Carlisle Fielding Stewart says by the power of what he calls soul force. An engagement with the Spirit is to empower us to take on spiritual self-agency, to be able to be uh, cooperatively and collaboratively uh, prescriptive of our, our spiritual destiny. It's a tridactic relationality, Ken Archer says, between the Word, the Spirit, and the community. That it's not just this dogmatic word that somebody else from another culture, from another time period, from another place, from another gender, from another outlook and worldview is telling us that this is what this says and means. But it's a tridactic relationality that gives us room at the table to exercise spiritual self-agency. In the early days of the Pentecostal movement, they used to ask if one's received their personal Pentecost. Now, I believe in the community. I believe that the church is being injured today because of the community. I'm going to do either either a podcast or I'm going to do a live stream on on what's killing the, the, the Pentecostal church today. One of the main things, the main things killing the Pentecostal church is individualism. And we don't see our spirituality as a communal spirituality. But even within the context of that communal spirituality, that idea of self-agency, communal self-agency, or community self-agency. For example, the spirituality that we expressed during slavery period had to be done in hush harbors, had to be done in speakeasies. They weren't really speakeasies. That was of the early 1900s. But they were done in places where you had to be in quiet, praise houses, down, in the, down by the rivers, and down oh, far away from the big house, far away from the master turning the pot down in the middle of the floor to do the ring shot around it because the pot, they believed, was going to absorb the noise, keep it inside the room. So that way they couldn't be found out by their masters because their masters only allowed them to worship in particular ways because they recognized that there was an internal, intrinsic soul force, Carlisle Fielding Stewart calls it, that if they ever tapped into it, they could not remain slaves any longer. They would not be slaves in their mind. And ultimately, once their minds were freed by that soul force, then they would never be able to be slaves in body again. Pentecostal spirituality is an expression and outworking of that soul force, that intangible in, in, uh, spiritual allurement that was endowed, uh, uh, we've been endowed with by our Creator. Yes, yes. You can go back and look uh, at the in the archives and see uh, uh, spirituality and the self hatred countering the self hatred that comes. I think that was with um, either Dr. Calvin Warren or Dr. Daniel Black was my was my guest on that night. And there's a whole there's a whole uh, there's a whole uh, live stream that we did on that. Go back through there and check it out. It'll be a blessing to you. Okay, so. Listen, I'm going to take the last few minutes. Um, this is a, my 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 paper is 28 pages long, and I'm only on page eight. And uh, but I have to stop right here. I'm going to pick up. This is some of the the stuff that I'm going to be talking about this weekend. I'll have the two morning sessions. I have the Friday morning, and I'll have the Saturday morning. Dr. Alexander will have the Friday afternoon, and Dr. Waddell will have the Saturday afternoon. And so we'll be engaging in these. And this is some of the uh, the the dialogue we're going to have. This is some of the instruction that I'm going to give, the facilitation and the interaction that we're going to have. So that way we can understand Pentecostal spirituality in a more fully orbed, well-rounded understanding. See, Pentecostal spirituality, thank you, Dr. May, for being registered for May 21st and 22nd. Others, others of you, about 50 others of you tonight need to go on and register tonight. Bishop, I can't make every day. Go on and register. I can't make both days. Register and come on the day you can. It will be a, a spiritual uplift to you. It will be, I want to provide things that, that give value to the community. 
Thank you so much, Martha Taylor. Thank you for being registered. Thank you, Dr. Bennett, for your kind affirmation. It's You're about overdue. I, I, I lied and said I wasn't going to have my guests, but once a year, so I wouldn't wear out my welcome. And I've had you twice already, but it feels like you're overdue for me to bring you back on here. And as the Dr. Bennett, as the people support, then I'm able to do better than I've done before. I'd buy you a hamburger before, and now I can send you at least to the steakhouse uh, if you come on before, if the people will help and support Global Pentecostal Perspectives. This live stream, uh, Dr. Liz Rios commented earlier. Man, it looks like your 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 technology is so clear. It's so it's so this that, and the other. Well, one of the things that we've done, we've made personal investment in making sure that that we've gotten our gotten our uh, our stream up to where it needs to be because we want to make sure that you can hear and see and experience the uh, Global Pentecostal Perspectives and Global Pentecostal Podcast in a way that both honors God and demonstrates excellence and in a way that helps you to be able to really drink deeply of all that the Lord is doing along that wise. Any of you all that are desirous of helping us along that wise tonight can do so by liking. If you haven't subscribed to, listen, if you have not subscribed to both my YouTube channel and the Global Pentecostal Perspectives YouTube channel, please do so. Jonathan Alvaro, I have my own YouTube channel. I have different offerings that come out on that. I'm, I do more mentoring, uh, mobilizing, and uh, and uh, in order for you to mastermind your future. That, that's my that's my personal YouTube channel. It's uh it's uh it's it's different than GPP and it's different from Global Pentecostal pa uh, Podcast. On this channel, I do a podcast that I'm, I'm bringing out once a week and a live stream every Saturday night. And those will have content that is more germane to Pentecostal spirituality. So I want you to, the point is, I want you to subscribe to both places. So that way you can you can be a part of all the the, the world of, a, of this new YouTuber. Thank you, Dr. Alex Stewart. Thank you so very much. Good to see you, Alexander Stewart, on here tonight. Great Pentecostal scholar, archivist, uh, 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 I want to call you something else, uh, pastor and leader. I'm grateful for your presence on tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great, 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 uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, group of, of learners and, and Pentecostal adherents. Okay, we've got uh, about six minutes. Any other questions? Any other questions? Sign up for PayPal so I can give. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That means such a great Do You signed up for PayPal just so you could give to GPP. Thank you so, so very much. That means a great deal to me. Any others of you that have any questions or comments or concerns, anything within the last five minutes of our time together on tonight, my only concern, precious dears, is that you will sign up for the uh, symposium that is forthcoming on this week. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, 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 starting on Monday, I will be putting everything out all over Facebook, all over YouTube, all over, um, all over Twitter, all over Instagram, every place where I have social media presence, I'm going to be putting out advertisement every day to encourage you. So if you don't want to be bugged by me, you come on and register on tonight, register tonight, tonight, tonight. Don't wait. Don't say, I'm going to do it tomorrow. Don't say, I'm going to do it next, part, next week. No, get it tonight. Get registered tonight. That way you know, we'll know who to expect. We'll know how to prepare. We'll know we'll be able to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh how to operate. Good. Great question. Here's the question. Can you clarify the Wesleyan approach versus the Keswick approach? And Keswick is actually K-E-S-W-I-C-K. It's pronounced Keswick, though it looks like Keswick, okay? Keswick is a five, is, uh, there are two basic dimensions uh, of distinction between Wesleyan holiness and Keswick spirituality. And that is Wesleyan holiness, which many, if not most Pentecostals subscribe to, although there's a, I mean, there's a big group of Keswick uh, 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 spirituality comes out of the Reformed Baptistic tradition. But Wesleyan spirituality says two things. That first, God, Jesus is seen in a five-fold expression. Jesus is Savior, Sanctifier, Baptizer in the Holy Spirit, Healer, Coming King. Five expressions. Jesus, Savior, Sanctifier, Baptizer in the Holy Spirit, Healer, Soon Coming King. Okay? Keswick, and, and they believe in, pro, in uh, progressive sanctification, that as we live unto God and receive the Holy Spirit, and, and I, when I say receive the Holy Spirit, I mean they see sanctification, Wesleyans see sanctification as a separate crisis event. Salvation is first. I get saved. 
as the testimony goes, then I'm sanctified as a separate crisis event. And once I'm sanctified, I can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's a progressive revelation. It's progressive sanctification. Whereas Keswick, which comes out of a Reformed and Baptistic tradition, and Assemblies of God, many of them operate from this perspective. It's twofold. It's Baptistic in that it is positional. It is a it is a view. Wesleyans operate from a, a view toward the cross, where our view is toward the mortification of our flesh and the deeds of our flesh and moving toward the cross to identify in solidarity with Christ. Keswick view is a view from the cross that says it's already done. Your position is stable. You're eternally secure. It's, it's that kind of thing. And it's an embrace of a fourfold gospel that expresses that idea of it's already done. They believe in Jesus as Savior, Sanctifier, together, that you're sanctified the moment you're saved. Then you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then uh, uh, Jesus as, as baptized in the Spirit, Jesus as healer, and Jesus as coming King. Fourfold gospel, Savior, Sanctifier, all in one, because they see it as a positional reality, not as a progressive reality. Okay? Wesleyans are more progressive than positional in that way. Okay. All right. Great question. Great question. Let me see this. Is the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost totally Pentecostal? No. Trinitarian theology was part of the Antonicene tradition. I just taught this in the in the class that the seminary gave, and we gave on uh, patristic theology. One, uh, the idea of the first four centuries of the church, they were hammering out. The God, the Godhead, who is Jesus, Jesus' divinity, who is the Holy Spirit in this scheme, how, how they relate, you know, homoousius, homo uh, this idea of same substance of Jesus and the Father, he's the same substance, the 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 filiqui controversy that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, and the Eastern Church says, uh, the Western Church says, and the Son, so they add this et filia, this filiqui, uh, et filiqui, which, and, which, which means and the Son. And so the Eastern Church rejects that, that, that whole nine yards. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is not totally Pentecostal because 25% of Pentecostals are oneness. They believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the Father. Jesus is the Son. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Okay? Some people call that from the, from the patristic period. The Antonicene period, there was a term, that it was labeled a heresy. They called it Sabalianism or modalism, okay, dynamic monarchianism. These are all heresies surrounding oneness theology, okay? Now, that's what it was called then, but 25% of Pentecostals today are oneness Pentecostals. I want to be clear about that. And on them, I sense the Holy Spirit, and in them, I sense the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm, very, I'm, not, I'm not quick to call anybody a heretic. But I am I am open to the dialogue and and to, and to hearing and understanding. No one calls Jesus uh, that, that, that says, says Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. That's what the Word says. And nobody calls Jesus Lord except they do it by the Spirit. Okay. All right. Great question. A great question. Let me see. Uh, can you can you say something about C.H. Mason ordaining ministers who later became founders of the Church of the Nazarene? No, the Church of the Nazarene precedes. Uh, the Church of God in Christ. Okay, the Church of the Nazarene is a holiness church. Now, mind you, during that time, during the holiness movement of the 18th century, the 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 the, the, the uh, John Wesley lived from 1903 to uh, I'm sorry, 1703 to 1791, and so he, as the father of the holiness movement in the 18th century, then the 19th century full blown holiness movement coming out of Wesleyan spirituality, Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Whitefield, and others, these are the, the underpinnings of the holiness movement. Well, then out of that comes churches like the Church of the Nazarene. And here's the curious thing, because they believed in sanctification as a second work of grace. John Wesley's own testimony of his heart being strangely warm as he read the book of Romans at, uh, the, at the church at Aldergate. Uh, I think it's important to understand that, that that second work of grace, they felt like was the Pentecostal outpouring of the Spirit. The Church of the Nazarene used to be called the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene. 
But when pe- the modern Pentecostal movement came in in the 20th century, with all of its ex- ecstasy and all of its uh, all of its uh, kind of oddities in terms of, of of its practices, spiritual practices, many persons that did like the um, like the uh, Free Will Baptist Church. They used to be called the Pentecostal Free Will Baptist Church. But many of those denominations who came out of holiness dropped Pentecostal when the early uh, Pentecostal movement began because of some of the the kind of exotic and ecstatic behavior of early Pentecostals. They didn't want to identify with that, though they believed in the second work of grace, the second uh, work of sanctification. Okay? What a great insight. Good, 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 good. Thank you for asking that question. Let me see here. Okay, good. Instant. Okay, you're answering a question. Very good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Well, friends, I'm two minutes, 40, 41 seconds over uh, the hour and a half mark that we've designated. You're always so kind in staying on with me and making sure that we are we are good to the last drop. Listen, the only other thing to do tonight is for at least 100 people to get a 10 or $20 offering and give it to Global Pentecostal Perspectives. That's the only thing to do tonight. Other than to register for the symposium, the only other thing to do is to support with liking and subscribing and sharing and hitting notifications, telling neighbors and friends, and to support Global Pentecostal Perspectives. And if you do so, I guarantee you will be this will be a blessing in your life. We will be able to continue in bringing this kind of teaching, this kind of instruction, this kind of engagement, both with the Spirit and with the community. Listen to me very carefully. I'm so strongly persuaded that this is a necessary, necessary uh, 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 outwork or a, a necessary lighthouse for Pentecostal spirituality. I'm so convinced of it that I put my name, my reputation, my resources on the line to be able to do this. This started off as just a devotional, 20-minute, 30-minute devotional for my church on Saturday nights. But when the questions started coming and the observations started being made and the desire for growth and learning came, then we took it and moved forward with it. And I believe that by God's grace, we're coming up on a year now. The third Saturday in June will be one full year that we've been operating in uh, global, as global Pentecostal perspectives. And what a blessing God has done. From zero to over 2,200, almost 2,250 subscribers. Over 2,000 people, almost 2,250 people have subscribed to this channel. That says something to you. In less than a year, they have, they have said, we need this. We want to learn from this. We want to grow from this. And you make that possible. Now, some people subscribe because of one uh, uh, particular live stream or one particular teaching or one particular conversation, and, they, and they're not fully engaged. But some of you that are on tonight, are ones that are connected and engaged and the ones that participate and the ones that support. And I'm calling upon you to help me spread global Pentecostal perspectives as it has been a blessing to you. I seek to add value to your life. And I am thoroughly convinced, I can be talked out of it, that Pentecostal spirituality is the third wave of Christendom. Catholicism was the first wave. Protestantism was the second wave. Pentecostalism in all of its iterations is the third wave of Christendom. And those that are not engaged in it and leaning in and drinking deeply of it are going to miss out on some of the wonderful things that the Spirit of Grace is doing in this hour as she leads and guides us into all truth. My desire for you and hope for you is you will take this opportunity to continue to support by way of your presence by way of your influence, liking and subscribing and sharing and doing all those things, you know this channel would really blow up if everybody that watched every week would just put it on some other kind of medium. You watch it on YouTube, okay, put it out on your Facebook. You watch it on Facebook, okay, put it out on your Twitter. If everybody would just share it in that way, it would blow up. It would blow up. It wouldn't be able to be contained. If everybody would do what you do, and that is put in comments, engage with the stream, particularly on YouTube, because when you do it on YouTube, it it puts us in the the analytics, the, however the formulas they do. The analytics it moves us to the top of the analytics. So when people are looking for the for for something about Pentecostalism, it brings us to the top because of all of their engagement. So as much as you are benefited and as much value is added to your life, I would that you would help make it available to others so that way their lives will be made valuable, given value, 
through this teaching and this engagement. I love you deeply. I'm greatly appreciative for you. Tomorrow is a very special day. So much good stuff is happening. Mother's Day was that last Sunday. This coming Sunday is my precious bride, Dr. Tony Alvarado. Her birthday is tomorrow. We're celebrating her at Grace Church International all day on tomorrow. Her actual birthday is tomorrow. And so I'm so grateful to the Lord for his saving grace and his keeping power. And he's kept my wife for the last 58 years. If she's alive tomorrow, and I believe she will be, uh, that for 58 years, by God's grace, she's been on the planet and uh, just been enjoying this season of grace. Um, It's a fantastic day tomorrow. Tomorrow is her birthday. Tomorrow is my daughter's graduation from Spelman College. So by God's grace, uh, she has gone through Spelman College in three years and is graduating with a a degree in music and on her way to graduate school. She's already got acceptance and full scholarships and full fellowship to to graduate school. And I'm so proud and excited for her. So we're sharing. Tomorrow we'll be at the church ministering at Grace Church International. You can catch our live stream there at 1130. And then we're going to be dashing out of there. Don't look for us at the end because we will be gone because we got to get down to our daughter's graduation and we'll be there in the in the separated socially distant stands with masks uh, uh encouraging uh, all the graduates of Spelman's class of 2020 and 2021 I believe they're doing graduations together and work I'm grateful to the Lord for for my daughter's graduation in the class of 2021 celebrating Pastor Tony and all the goodness. The church will be celebrating her on tomorrow. And if you want to celebrate her, you can do so as well. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, come on our live stream and you can celebrate with us, celebrate with her, her birthday on tomorrow. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, uh, Miss Yvette. Thank you so much for for your kind affirmation and for sharing this on your Facebook page. Thank you. I'm going to convey, I will convey happy birthday to Dr. Tony. I will do it in Jesus' name. Good. Martha, I'm going to I'm going to tell Dr. Tony congratulations uh, for our daughter because uh, our daughter, Pastor Tony, gave me this wonderful, wonderful girl. I couldn't have asked for a, a better gift. I'm proud of her too. I'll tell her that you say congratulations and I will, I will convey happy birthday to my bride and congratulations to my daughter. I will do it. I will do it in Jesus name. Thank you so much. All right, precious dears. Thank you for being on with me on tonight. I will see you uh, next week. Check me out on Jonathan Alvarado on my YouTube channel. I'll be putting out my next, uh, my next uh, blog, uh, uh, vlog there on Monday. It comes out and uh, be looking out for the, the last podcast I just did on the GPP channel on five tips for digital min- Pentecostal ministry in a digital environment. And then on tonight, thank you for being with me on Global Pentecostal Perspectives.